if you got up to this point like like I did here you've got some website with a little bit of text with an image with a link uh, this is a fully functional website it doesn't look that nice yet but that's what's coming up here with CSS I want to resize my image I didn't realize it was gonna be that big so I need to resize it and maybe I want to change the colors of things and the fonts and such so um, let's talk a little bit about CSS that's the the language where we can style our our design now when you do your reading they will mention three types of CSS I'm gonna do one type at the moment but for the assignment you're gonna to need to do a slightly different type and that's why you're gonna read the lecture and see the difference but just to get us started right here I'm go we're going to create some embedded CSS so that means let's back up to where our head block is at our section of code where the head is at mine is on line 3 to 6 your line numbers do not need to line up exactly as mine that that almost never happens and that's fine but when I say let's go to line 7 and yours is on line 9 obviously don't freak out you're just on slightly different numbers but you need to go to the section head after our meta tag that defines our character set after our title so after our meta element after our title element we'll add a new element style what will exist in this block is CSS what will exist here is CSS code this is gonna be like its own little world of CSS you can make embedded CSS embedded right into a file or you can make external CSS which we'll get to later in a separate file I'll break that apart into a couple of lines and then I'll write this code right here this is a CSS comment that does not look like my HTML comment that I wrote down here it's using a different code here we have the angle bracket exclamation dashes my comment end of the comment dash dash angle here it's slash forward slash asterisk my comment and then backwards asterisk slash so when you're writing comments in the CSS code area it looks like that when you write comments in the HTML code area it looks like that so just something to memorize a little different now we write CSS code here in the syntax syntax is just a fancy way of saying how do you write it what's the structure of how you write it we see that the syntax for HTML is usually an opening element and then it's closing element we're marking from here to here is a heading this is the syntax an opening and a closing tag in HTML sometimes in HTML we further have the syntax of we need an attribute to give more detail especially to a, an element that is empty that doesn't have a pair image does not have a pair we saw doc type does not have a pair there's a couple of HTML elements a couple of HTML tags that don't have a pair but oftentimes have an attribute so HTML has a syntax a certain way to write it CSS has a syntax and basically it is selector curly braces property colon value semicolon okay that looks totally different there's no opening and closing there's no angle brackets now there's a curly bracket curly bracket is right between your P uh, key and your backslash it's near the backspace near the minus and plus above the quotes there is a square bracket and then you shift and there's a curly bracket so square brace or bracket and then curly bracket or curly brace I'll 
I'll say on that one, very rare in CSS. Very common in CSS. Okay, so the syntax. We have a selector. We have some little piece of code that selects something. We have some CSS rule. We have some selector. We have something that identifies a piece of the HTML. So we'll say a selector identifies or selects an HTML element or tag. So I'm going to say over here, I want to target or select or identify a, an image so that I can set the property of the height to a value of 10. I'm going to create a selector, I'm going to create a rule that targets my text to change the property to be the value of a font, Arial. So this basic syntax, selector, which then has properties and values, is what we're going to do here. So after the comment, body, brackets, background color. And again, when you're using one of these code editors, you often have a pop-up that can help you. So I'm going to look for body background color. I can type it myself manually, or when I see it there, I can just double click it and it'll finish it for me. Or I can use the arrow keys up and down. And when I find it, I press enter, background color, colon, space. And then it pops up to say, here's all of the default colors we have. A lot of colors. I'll just say red, semicolon. Now you may or may not have extra spaces here, that's fine. In the readings it mentioned about the concept of white space, which is basically, as long as you type the code properly, usually it does not matter if you've got spaces or tabs. So, so this is over here in the style still of the selector I mentioned in line 10. So we've got a body selector. This is saying, wherever the body tag exists, let's change the property, background color, to the value of red, semicolon, the end. Save it and run it, and you should see a nice eye-piercing red background color behind everything. Save it, I'm going to run it. <clears throat> red. So that's CSS. It's <clears throat> a different language, but it's related to HTML. You can't really use CSS without HTML, and then HTML by itself without CSS is kind of boring, so they have kind of a symbiotic relationship. One relies on the other. The syntax is very different. But it's still, um, you're going to see things that are familiar. I'm saying wherever I see the, wherever the body element exists, do this. I've got one body. Uh, remember, guys, over here, a little bit quieter if you need a little bit of help. So um, we've got body tag right here, and it'll change to a background color of red. OK, next line. Let's say P. Wherever there's a paragraph, I want to change the background color of that text as well. Let's say brackets, background color, we'll do black. So we're saying here, wherever a P tag is used in the body of my HTML file, set the background color property to the value of black. Save it and run it, and what do we get? 
we get right here where I wrote a paragraph. It's black. My text is still there, but it's black text on a, on a black background, so then I can't see it. And where else do I have any paragraphs? I've got a paragraph behind the image. I see a little bit of Im uh, black behind my image. Okay, so I put I put a black color, a background color of black, wherever I've got a paragraph, and I've got one paragraph so far. I can't read my text. So if only there was a property that would let me affect my color of text. Guess what? Someone thought of that, and there is. So with CSS, it's sort of the same thing about there's 200 properties to choose from. You don't have to have them all memorized. You just have to look up the one that you need, then use it and maybe memorize it. But there's a property that affects the text color. So I'm going to say space. I'm still inside of the curly brackets, because here I'm going to say wherever there's a paragraph, do this and do something else and do something else. Body right now just says, wherever you've got a body, do this, the end. With paragraph, I'm going to say background color will be this, and then text color will be this. So if we've got background color, what do you think we have for text color? If you thought text color, you're wrong. No one had the good idea to call it text color when they invented this. They called it simply color. So you just have to memorize. Background color means background color. But color means text color. And it's the same syntax. I've got some sort of property, colon, space, some sort of value, end of command, end of statement, end of, of the pair. That has a specific name as well, that pair. I'm blanking on what that is exactly. That has a name as well when it's a pair. So this paragraph will have a background color and a text color, the end. Now, if you save it and run it, your text, your black text that was in a black paragraph, now becomes white text in a black paragraph, and you can actually read it. There we go, I can read it. Is. You don't you don't love that? <laughs> no? Okay, if you don't like the red background, go ahead and change it. How about Alice Blue? We have some funny um, names of colors in here that are built in. There's Alice Blue. There's Brick, I think. Brick Red or Brick or something. There's um, Brown. There's Gold. There's a bunch of built-in colors. There's only about 114 built-in colors, but we can also devise our own color formulas. We'll cover that later, because I may not find the perfect red color from my list here. Or maybe my company's red color is not in the list here. You know, that one of brown, that's not right. Crimson, that doesn't look quite right. Dark red, that doesn't look quite right. So we also have a way, which we'll get to eventually, to... Um, to devise our own color formula. But for the moment, I'm just going to change to another color. And this will probably be better right here, right? It's a lot more visible. No? Okay. So the thing about CSS is uh, using the right selector to target a certain element, and then using the right property and value so then change it somehow. I want to change my image. My image is too big. My image has a width and a height. So based on me telling you that, I would like to change my image's width and height to 50-50. You should be able to do that based on two lines we've done so far. Try that. Change your image, the width and height, to 50 pixels. See if you can maybe do that on your own. I'll do it in a moment. But think about it logically. Based on what we've done so far, I want to change my image so that it has a width of 50 pixels and a height of 50 pixels. Think you can do that maybe? The idea is I'm going to identify some sort of tag, so I need to write the image tag, and I have some property and some value, a property of width, 
colon, 50 pixels, and a property of height, 50 pixels. So once you kind of know the basic syntax, I'm going to target an image. Brackets. I'm going to then choose the width property, 50 pixels, and the height property, colon, 50 pixels. End of statement. So now that image of mine is not huge anymore. It's 50 50. 50 tall, 50 wide. It is about knowing the property. Maybe you, maybe you think about it, yeah, it's tall and it's wide. What if I wrote tall 50 and wide 50? Those don't exist, so it would ignore them. Whenever you try to write code that doesn't exist, that it doesn't know what you mean, it ignores it. It goes back to the default. So if I wrote with, or if I wrote with, one of them is right and one of them is wrong. And color-wise, why is that red and why is that purple? That one's right and that one's wrong. But to check that result, okay, there it is. Couple problems. Now it's too small. And it looks a little squashed. So, okay, maybe I'll play with it. Uh, 250 tall or wi wide and maybe 550 tall. I'm just picking values. So they may or may not be good. Uh, it's, now it looks too stretched out. But what I'm showing you here is I'm able to affect this element. I'm able to target the image element, the image tag. I'm using specific properties with specific values, and I've changed it. Uh, one trick actually is with images, you don't really need to define both values. If you only define one value, it, it's actually smart enough to know to keep the other value in proportion. That might be a good idea to write a comment about that. With images, or we'll say regarding images, if you only set one with height property, the other is auto set proportionally so that it doesn't look squashed or stretched. So I can save myself some effort here by only setting one of the widths or heights, and the other one shrinks or grows accordingly, and it looks like it's in the proper proportion, not too stretched or not too squashed. I'll make a separate note over here. CSS selectors, aka rules. Sometimes people call them one thing, sometimes another. I think one is more technically correct. Selectors, I believe, is more technically correct. But you'll often also hear me calling them rules. Um, but CSS selectors can be on one line or multiple lines. Recommend multiple. I recommend that you divide up your uh, selectors into multiple lines because it'll be easier to read. I won't go back to fix it, but I, what I mean is here. This paragraph, this has two properties, background color and color. It's actually a little bit more readable if I had them on separate lines. We'll do that as an example in a moment. But um, the web browser, when it takes your code and processes it, it doesn't care if you've got spaces or dashes or whatever, usually. I mean, spaces or tabs, usually. It just renders it. If you wrote it properly, it just renders it. But for us, especially us beginners, perhaps, 
where this is totally new, I do recommend that you divide up your code line by line and space it out to make it easier to, to see, like this. Let's do for H1, curly braces, and I'm going to break the curly braces into multiple lines. And then on one line, I will have background color. And then on another line, I'll have the text color. Just picking random colors. I don't know if they'll look good or not. But this is equivalent to that line right up there, line 15, or line uh, 16. This is what I would recommend. It's more readable. When you go back through your code later on to make more changes, I think this is a lot easier to deal with because on that one you have to think a little harder. Where does one property start and where does one end? You have to look for the semicolons. Okay, there's one, there's one. But here, multiple lines, same thing, but one's easier. There's a plugin for brackets to be defined code. We don't need to stick in plugins. We, we, we're going to do it from up here. Mm -hmm. Ah, encourage good habits. Mm -hmm. No coddling yet. So there we go. Um, I changed the color of my uh, heading 1 to uh, one thing that I don't like is when you click it, then it jumps to that part. OK, anyway. Um, I've changed my heading 1 to have a, a different background color than the default, and the color to have another one. As you go through your readings, you'll see more details. I'm not going through every single detail here. That's what your readings are for. You've got, again, about five readings to go through where, where it'll have much more detail because it'll talk about specificity and the cascade and what about if I write two rules that target the same thing. We'll get to those details, if not together, in the lecture text. So definitely read those. Don't just rely on this lecture or the video to do your final homework. Make sure you read the lectures as well. So my result is that. Um, let's say, OK, uh, we've just been playing with colors. We'll do fonts in a moment, but I first want to do this. Um, we've got three different subsections of your hobbies. I want to change them. All three of these, that is hard to read, but all three of these are made out of what element? This one, this one, and this one in my case. H3. So let's make a new rule to select or to target heading threes and change it somehow. And we can get very fancy. We're just doing background and foreground color. We'll get fancier, of course. But let's just say H3. Oops. H3. Notice the syntax. It doesn't use the angle brackets. Multiple lines and just some colors. I don't know. I'm just picking some colors. Let's go with aquamarine. And bisque. Maybe not. Um, purple. Purple, so we have Rebecca purple. Sure. OK. Now, in the resources link in Canvas, there is a link to the Adobe Color website. That's a website that helps you pick perfect colors. You like this color, and it'll recommend try also these other colors. They fit nicely. Right now, I'm just picking a mishmash of colors, and it shows. When you do your own actual project, you probably want much more pleasant colors, colors that actually match up and look nice together and such. In the resources for this week, there is a link to that website that I recommend that you look at to help you pick nice combinations of colors. The result here is, as before, all three of my headings have changed. Nice. But what I actually want is that each of those three headings is different. And you see here, when I write H3, every example of heading 3 is selected and altered. I want comic books to be a certain set of colors, magic to be a separate set of colors, and movies to be a separate set of colors. So now we have to write a different selector, a different rule, a different way to target. 
because these selectors that we've done so far have been element selectors. <coughs> Let's write some notes here. Element selectors. Target all examples of a certain element. Sometimes I want that, sometimes I don't. I don't want all of these H3s to look exactly the same. So we have two other ways to do selectors. Well, we have a few more, but we'll start with two more. ID selectors target one example of an element and may only be used once per document. Short answer. So we'll actually do it in a moment, but then we've got one more. Class selectors target all examples of an element and may be used many times per document. Well, that, that sounds similar to just a plain old element selector, but sometimes there isn't a specific element that we actually have that we can target. So then sometimes we need to sort of invent our own. So we'll say we invent IDs and classes. We don't invent HTML elements. They already exist. They've been defined in the specification for 30 years. They, they exist. We did not invent the P tag or the UL tag element. They're there. But we can invent our own classes or IDs as necessary. And again, it probably doesn't make too much sense until we do it or until you do the reading, which we'll do in one moment. put that into our notes and we will see another explanation another definition of it as you go through the lectures but in my case I have three h3s but I want them to be different so by creating an, an element selector that's not doing the job I need to use either an ID or a class we'll start with with we'll start with ID first we will say this particular h3 is further identified this way and this h3 is further identified that way and this third h3 is identified further so we'll, we'll do that one moment as you're finished typing here but we need to add an id attribute we add an id attribute or class attribute to an element to make it more unique. Right now all those all those three H3s are not unique. All three of them are H3s. They're not unique. Therefore my H3 code up there um, applies to all of them. I want to change it so that each one's a little different. And we invent them. So next line after the comment, make sure this is after the comment, we'll say the pound sign, like a hashtag, this is shift uh, three on the keyboard, we'll say red color brackets do another one um, yellow color brackets another green color brackets well it's still some sort of selector brackets you know the the um, 
the properties will still be the same of color red, color yellow, color green. I'm still going to select something and change it somehow. But now this is different. There's a pound sign here. No space between the pound sign and the name of the ID that we invented. There's no such thing as red color. There's no tag that exists. There's no element that exists called red color. We're inventing it. And we're saying that wherever red color is in the body, make it red. Wherever yellow color is in the body, make it yellow, and so forth. There is no red color ID anywhere in the body and there is no yellow or green so if I run it I don't see any change this is only half of the equation I've defined how I'm gonna change it but I haven't really said where because nothing over here is called red color or yellow color or green color and so I wrote, we add an ID attribute or a class attribute to an element to make it more unique. I've just invented the ID red color. So I want to apply it to my first H3. ID equals red color. red color. That H3 was the same as every other H3, no extra styling, and when I created my rule first, H3 is this, everything obeyed. But then I said now I want to change anything with an ID of red color to be red, and so I applied it right there. This H3 now make sure you're writing this inside of the angle brackets. It's, a, it's an attribute, just like we had the attribute for link. And image, we have the A tag, but then we need to give it, we needed to give it details, href. That was an attribute that was inside of the angle bracket. It was an attribute. We have an attribute called ID, and we set it equal to whatever we invent. I invented a code called red color. And what that means is up here. Wherever I have something of red color, give it a text color of red. So for my next one, my next H3, I'll give it an ID of yellow color. And for my third H3, I'll give it an ID of green color, spelled exactly the same. If I call this red color, capital C, but I call it down here, red color, lowercase c, my result is it ignores it. Capitalization does matter. That'll be a good note up here. We invent IDs. We add them. Capitalization matters. Red color is not the same as red color or red color or red color. Those are all different. So I invented it as red color, lowercase, so I need to use it as red color lowercase everywhere in the body. So by that logic, you should add your yellow color and your green color to your H, to your other H3s. And you should see the result that now each of those three classes has been more uniquely identified and changed. For hobbies, oops, not hobbies, uh, for, for magic, ID equals 
yellow color for movies id equals green color Did that work? Anyone need a little help? Are these IDs and such behaving? This is again a different sort of concept than HTML. The coding is, looks a little different. The syntax is a little different. Here's the, here's the CSS stuff up here, how that looks. And uh, we just invented some new IDs. But is that working? Anyone having any trouble? So I've set these colors, these text colors. Now, all of them, in my case, still have that aquamarine background color. And then, again, this is, this, this is normal. This is part of the concepts that you'll get into more detail in the, in the lectures. But basically, what I like to say when I teach this, HTML is easy. Honestly, if you struggled last week, okay, you struggled, but comparatively, HTML is easy. CSS is harder than HTML. There's more moving pieces. There's this, for example. This is still aquamarine. I thought I changed each one individually. That's the cascade and specificity, other things. It's a little harder. So HTML, easy. CSS, a little harder. JavaScript, hard. JavaScript is hard compared to those two. JavaScript is much more complex, the syntax is different, the commands are different, what it does is different, how all the code interacts with each other is different. Again, one, one wrong uh, character on that one definitely, one wrong character, everything breaks. Uh, on HTML and CSS, one wrong character, well, one thing breaks. JavaScript, everything breaks with one wrong character. It's the hardest one. There's a couple of books that I that I like using when I when I teach CIS 152 HTML and 165 JavaScript. In the HTML class, the uh, the book that I use in there is 500 pages long, and it covers HTML and CSS. In the JavaScript class, it's a book that's 600 pages long, and it's just JavaScript. So one book, two topics versus one book, 600 pages. So yes, it is harder, it is different, but you know, like I said, all you need is about 18 years and, and you'll get it. Or a few classes. So lots and lots of practice. Practice and tutoring and help and asking questions, and you'll get it. Here's the project so far. For instance, a good question would be what would happen if I used an ID more than once? Let's give that a try. Sometimes what happens is when we've got this code and we have an idea, what if I do this, what if I do that? The great thing is try it and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, just edit undo. What, the why and all of that could be a longer answer, but I mentioned up on the notes an ID should be only used once per document. But wait a minute, what if, what if I try it? Will my computer crash? Will smoke start to come out? What will happen if I use an ID twice, even though the instructor said not to? Let's see. I'm going to use an ID two times. The result doesn't seem so bad. I see it twice. And that's because depending on the browser, depending how strict it is and how well it follows the syntax sets and such, sometimes the browsers, they interpret the code in a strict way or, or in a loose way. In this case, Chrome is like, or uh, yeah, this is Chrome. Chrome is saying, okay, great, you use an ID twice, I guess we'll put it in two places. I think Chrome is being way too nice about it. It should not have applied it in two places. I think Firefox doesn't, and other browsers don't. It applies it in one place and then not the other. For whatever reason, Chrome is letting it apply on both places, although that's technically not correct. But really, this is much more important when we get to also like links and things, because we can use an ID for links, and if two things have the same name with an ID, your link might not go to the right place, your screen might not load properly. So short answer is um, you don't want to use the same ID in multiple places because it could confuse the web browser. 
And then the long answer on those details, it's going to be in the reading. But we have this unique identifier for each different heading. And um, it applies it uniquely to each thing. OK, let's look at an example of a class. We have these that are IDs. And I noted um, we had an ID, or over here, um, ID selector, uh, targets one example in, of an element. Class targets multiple, uh, multiple examples uh, of elements. Let's create some classes over here. These start with a dot. I often just use the examples of colors because they are the most straightforward that these things make sense. But CSS lets you affect the font and the size and the alignment and a lot of things. But we'll just keep it kind of simple with, uh, with some of this stuff. So we will say here dot um, purple color. And that'll have a color of purple. And then we'll do one, we'll just do one more. Um, gold color. Actually, let's do it that way. Silver color and purple color. So <clears throat> I defined these in my style block. These CSS rules apply to this one document. This CSS that I've written here is embedded. It's embedded into this document. And I've defined these CSS selectors lowercase. So when I use them, they should also be lowercase. And this is a class, because it has a dot. And those are IDs because they have a pound sign. So similar to how we added the ID attribute, we need to add the class attribute. And we will add this to, to one of each of your three items, but the same one. I'm going to add gold color to my first item, my second item, my first item. So gold class, we'll do silver in a moment. Uh, gold color, so the first one, the second one, the first one. So my list item in this section, I will add a class of gold color. One thing that you just have to memorize that at the top, it had a dot, but here it doesn't. At the top, it had a pound sign, but here it doesn't. Basically, the word ID is represented by the pound sign at the top. And basically, the word class is represented by the dot at the top. It's just one of the things to memorize, that up here in the style block, I do have the pound and the dot, because this is basically saying ID, and this is saying class. But don't put them over here. If I put ID equals pound red color, it's sort of like saying ID equals ID, and that's going to break things. And if I had over here class equals dot, that's sort of like class equals class, and that's not right either. So no, the symbols are not down here, but they are at the top. And then to my second item in my second area, I'll add the same um, class. And to the third one. Uh, well, the third one's a link, so that's slightly different. So I'll put it on the first. So I've got the same class on three different things. That's valid. That's the purpose. The class attributes 
purpose is to be used multiple times in one document, that one class used multiple times in this document. That's the purpose of class. The purpose of ID should only be one item, one element per, per, per document. Even if it looks like it works, don't rely on that. The official specification says, you know, once per document for ID. And when I check the result over here, I will I will see uh, gold color class. Color gold. And hmm, that should appear gold. Does it appear? Does it change color on yours on your dot? Yes. Yes. Okay. What did I do with my? Did I misspell something? List item class gold color. Dot gold color. Right. I spelled it right. Right. Oh, the, um, by gold. Uh, yeah. There we go. That probably was it. Okay, let's check that. See that one character could confuse things. And, hmm, still not. Okay, well here's where we all troubleshoot each other or, or me. What am I missing here? Oh yes, there we go, that other semicolon right there. There we go, good eye. See that? Easy to miss these things. I did that on purpose, of course, yes. So. There we go, colors. So when it didn't when it didn't know what you meant, it ignored it. It stayed with the default color that was there. I wanted it to change to gold. I had two mistakes. Uh, one, I put my semicolon in the wrong place up here. So if I tried to use silver, it'll probably not have worked. And then I put the colon over here for some reason, and then it didn't it didn't work because the syntax is something space curly braces something colon etc. There's a certain way. I wrote it the wrong way. So it ignored it. And then the result when it's correct looks like that. So three different things are all being applied or affected by that class. OK, so we've done a lot of fun stuff with colors. We've changed a little bit of like the size of a graphic. There's still a lot of other CSS that we can work with. Let's take one more break. Uh, when we come back, we'll look at a couple of more CSS properties and a couple CSS uh, concepts. So it's 3.05. We'll take a break until 3.15. We'll come back to a little bit more lecture, and we'll have some lab time.